by Dr. Uh, Van Vanderplatz. And so I'm pleased to introduce her. Um, she's joining us as um, someone who had um, joined the webinar and had been following it and offered to um, teach us a little bit. And so I'm happy to have her on from California. She'll give a little bit more on her background and I'm pleased to have you. So go ahead and take it away, Dr. Vanderplatz. Can you guys hear and see my screen? We can. Okay, perfect. Um, so hi, um, I'm Dr. Allison Vanderplatz. Uh, I was lucky enough to just stumble upon this series one day, and I've actually learned a lot from these webinars from more of a producer perspective, um, but I'm happy to kind of contribute some of my knowledge as well. So um, just a little about me so you know kind of who I am. I am a large animal vet um, with a special interest in education, um, as well as small ruminant care, appropriate pain management and medication use. Those are all my professional interests. I currently teach as an associate professor of animal science at College of, Sequo of the Sequoias, where I also manage a small flock of um, sheep that we sh sell as 4-H FFA projects, um, as well as some cattle and pigs. I also recently started my own educational consulting business with really a focus on ag teacher education and uh, producer small farm education. Um, we have spent a lot of time kind of perfecting uh, common SOPs, um, certain treatment protocols, developing educational how-to videos, um, and more. And I will actually be leaving my current position to go back to school uh, at Iowa State University um, over the summer so that I can become a board certified specialist in food animal practice. So that's a little bit about who I am. Um, Carmen has set this up amazingly for me. So thank you very much, Carmen. Um, I'm gonna do just a very brief kind of um, just different perspective review of what Carmen talked about and then get into some of the other things that I commonly deal with as a small ruminant veterinarian. So as we already know, GFI 263 um, means all antibiotics are changing to prescription only as of June 11, 2023. Um, an interesting thing, I know we have everyone from all over the country here, uh, but in California, we've actually been this way since 2018. So this is something that I'm very familiar with. This transition period was really right when I came out of vet school and started working with my own producer. So a lot of the questions that you'll probably have, I will be able to give you a little bit of my personal experience with just because this is something that we've had in place for a little while here. Um, as Carmen said, our goal for GFI 263 is really to just combat antimicrobial resistance and ensure that we continue to have medications that actually work against the diseases that we're seeing. What we don't want to do is end up, you know, 10 years down the road and all of our medications are absolutely ineffective because we've used them inappropriately and we have contributed to that antimicrobial resistance. So some reasons that uh, resistance kind of comes from would be incorrect indications. So that means you're using an antibiotic for maybe a disease that doesn't need an antibiotic, or maybe you're using an antibiotic that is not actually effective against the organism that is causing that disease. Another reason might be incorrect dose. So a lot of our livestock medications are based on weight. So if you don't have an accurate weight for your animal, most people underdose, but it's also possible to overdose, give too much. Incorrect frequency, so not giving it as often as it should be given. As Carmen mentioned at the end there, if it says give it for four days, you should give it for four days. Stopping early actually allows some of those bacteria to hang out and actually survive the treatment process that wouldn't have otherwise survived if we had finished out that treatment regimen. Then finally, incorrect administration, not being given by the appropriate route. So again, if it says to give it sub-Q, you should give it sub-Q. Um, other reasons, not just combating antimicrobial resistance so that we as livestock producers and livestock veterinarians have antibiotics to use in the future, but also because many of the antibiotic classes or families that we use within livestock medicine have human counterparts. So we're not only looking out for the health of our animals, we're also looking out for human health. Finally, requiring a prescription means that veterinarians will be able to recommend appropriate medications, including indications, route, dope, 
dose, frequency, and withdrawal. And that last point is really, really especially important for small ruminants because we really do not have very medications that are labeled, legally labeled, for use in sheep and goats. So it's funny, uh, I had incorporated, I sent Carmen a couple of my slides and then uh, I added this one later and she has already done kind of the intro to penicillin here. So I'm gonna skip over the top part of this and just go down to that part, 2003. Uh, so in 2003, which was 20 years ago, penicillin procaine G or PPG maybe as you know it, um, got a generic formulation. And on that label in 2003, the label dose was one cc per 100 pounds. And that was at that time an effective dose. Today, if you look at your bottle of penicillin, it has that same dose on it. It still says one cc per 100 pounds. However, we are now 20 years in the future from when this was labeled. So that dose is actually not effective anymore. However, you as a producer can't actually give a medication at a different dose than what is on the label legally without veterinary oversight. So our actual effective dose for today is actually somewhere between four and six cc's per 100 pounds, depending on our species. And uh, that is simply because penicillin has been available forever and we like to use it for everything. It's cheap and it's pretty broad spectrum, so it works against a lot of things. If you are interested in a little bit more of kind of the discussion surrounding antibiotic use, uh, this first paper is really, really interesting, and I've linked it actually at the end so you can see the link because I understand you can't click the hyperlink here. Um, but it's a really nice review paper that goes through all of the major events that led up to kind of where we're at today and what these changes are actually a result of. That second paper there is a recent paper um, talking about how even though penicillin is currently labeled the way it is, we have found that it is actually not effective at those doses anymore and does a little bit of discussion about how um, one of our support organizations, FARAD, uh, does research to help us as veterinarians determine, is this medication actually working? So bottom line, all antimicrobials will still be available. You just have to talk to your veterinarian, okay? So the goal would be today, you find a veterinarian to form a relationship with. Um, we call this the BCPR, the Veterinary Client-Patient Relationship. And uh, it varies a little bit by state. So each state will have their own requirements for what is required for a valid VCPR. But as Carmen mentioned, overall, the veterinarian assumes responsibility for patient care. The client, which would be you as the owner, says, yes, I will comply with the veterinarian's recommendation. The veterinarian has some familiarity with the farm, how the animals are managed, how many animals you have, how you're bringing them in, uh, treatment protocols, vaccine protocols, et cetera. The vet is available for follow-up. The vet provides oversight of treatment, compliance, and more. And then we maintain patient records. So what does that actually mean? Because that kind of description is not especially helpful if you're like, okay, we'll maintain patient records, allow treatment, whatever. Veterinarians are more than just call me for your trash fire emergencies. Someone is dying right now, okay? Uh, we can offer help in a whole lot of different ways. So probably the first thing you think of is disease identification and treatment. And that's relevant to this discussion because that does include medication prescription. But we can also help evaluate your facilities and recommend improvements. I work with a lot of school farms who are very cash flow limited, but we can still find small fixes that can greatly increase um, how the animals move through that facility or decrease stress in moving through that facility. Biosecurity evaluation and improvement. How are you bringing animals onto your farm? If you do show or fairs or whatever, what precautions can you take with you to prevent you bringing back disease to your farm? vaccine and treatment protocol creation and implementation. Every single farm is different um, from setup to animal population, to finances, to goals. So everyone should have their own personalized vaccine and treatment protocols. Records evaluation and help with management decisions. Maybe you shouldn't keep that doe that you've had for 12 years who you have to treat for mastitis every single year, three times a year, you know, like we can help you make those decisions or help try to manage some of those things. Feeding guidelines and pasture management, proper procedure for injections, tail docking, disbudding, et cetera. 
disaster preparedness stuff. So I'm in California, we do have a lot of wildfires. Um, I'm actually in the Central Valley. So we dealt with a ton of flooding this year. So having a plan, you know, if this thing happens that commonly happens where we live, what are we gonna do with our animals? What things might we need to look out for? Smoke inhalation, um, I don't know, issues with skin following standing in muddy water for three weeks. And then finally that emergency care and treatment. So part of helping pay for someone to be your veterinarian means that you're not just calling them in the middle of the night. It means that you have a professional relationship with them. They have an idea of who you are, what you're about, what you do with your animals. And they know kind of, okay, well, I know that if so-and-so calls me, it's a bad, bad deal. And I know them, I've been there. Um, I can tell you, hey, I'll be there in 20 minutes. Or if I already know you and we've gone through some of these other things, maybe I have a treatment protocol already written, already available to you that I can refer you to while I get my truck and drive on my way out to you. So with the VCPR, establish a veterinary relationship now. And I saw one of the questions already. There are not a lot of veterinarians who work with small ruminants. It's absolutely true. It's definitely a little bit of a specialty thing. Um, AASRP, which is the American Association of Small Ruminant Practitioners, has a find a vet um, search on their website. And the last time I looked at it, it was not actually a complete list, but it would be a place to start. Um, and then as Carmen mentioned, more and more veterinarians are going towards uh, kind of the, oh man, the word just left me, but kind of specialty, I will come visit you, you know, once a month or I'll be in this area. How many farms can I fit in during my three days there, that sort of thing. So it may not be your idea of the perfect veterinary relationship, but there absolutely are opportunities or options for you to find veterinary care. So I just wanted to include a couple um, just kind of overviews of things that uh, are common for small ruminants and which of these you might need medications for. So this is a not exhaustive list of small ruminant diseases that I commonly see for both sheep and goats. I haven't really split them up here. Uh, there is quite a bit of overlap. If we look at that same list, and think about how many of these diseases might also require antibiotics as part of the treatment. You see quite a few of those are bolded and italicized. Some of the ones that are on there that are not bolded and italicized may actually also you have antibiotic treatment. It really just depends on how severe the case is. Then if we think about not just antibiotics, but other prescription drugs like anti-inflammatories or other kind of nutritional support stuff that maybe right now you can get or maybe not, um, that list gets a whole lot more extensive. So the point of me showing you this is just to say you need to have a relationship with a veterinarian because these medications are not going to be available. And one of the really big complicating factors right now is the number of back orders that we have on things. Um, lidocaine, for example, which is how we anesthetize, we do local anesthesia for most of our livestock surgeries, is very, very limited. So we are extremely, we're trying to find other avenues or ways to problem solve around that. So it's not just, um, you know, oh, well, it's not going to be available because now it's under veterinary prescription. Because of supply chain ongoing issues, some of these things just literally are not available. Like we cannot get them. So that's just something else to keep in mind. So if we think about all those diseases and then we think about, okay, so how many medications do I actually have labeled for sheep and goats? The answer is not very many. So when we talk about approved medications, that means you pick up the bottle and you see for use in sheep or goats on the label, okay? Um, these medications have gone through a very extensive review process by the Food and Drug Administration Center for Veterinary Medicine. They're the ones who kind of take in all the information from the pharmaceutical companies that are trying to get new drugs approved or labels modified. And they're going to look at both safety and efficacy of those medications. Safety means they're not only looking at is it safe for the animal, but also is it safe for the food products uh, that are going to be made from that animal. So if I give this goat an antibiotic, is the meat from that goat going to be safe for human consumption? 
As far as efficacy goes, they are looking at the data to say like, okay, well, did the company prove that that medication actually worked for what they are claiming it works against? So those are two things that they're spending a lot of time looking at, evaluating data, looking through multiple studies, usually by whatever um, sponsoring pharmaceutical company has submitted it. But they're also looking at safety for those giving the drug to the animal. So if I am a person who is giving that drug to a sheep and I accidentally stab myself with it, is that safe? Um, how long the drug lasts in the animal's body? So that leads us to kind of our next point, which is withdrawal times. How quickly does the animal's body metabolize that medication? And after what period of time are those animal products safe for human consumption? And finally, the drug's impact on the environment. So again, if you're interested in kind of this whole process, the FDA has this um, very extensive uh, kind of article of how they evaluate those things. So every single new drug has to go through this safety efficacy process. Small ruminants are considered minor species because they don't contribute economically in the way that some of our other species do. So think of dairy cattle, beef cattle, swine, uh, horses. Those are our big species. Cats and dogs are also in there, but they're companion species. So we're gonna ignore them for now. So minor species are basically everything besides those. So at the top of that list are sheep and goats, but that also includes game birds, emus, rabbits, guinea pigs, et cetera. Because the medication approval process that we just talked about has to happen for every single species to be included on the label, most pharmaceutical companies do not want to pay the extra million or whatever it's going to cost them to get our minor species on the label. They're not going to see the economic benefit from doing that in most cases. So these, this is our list. These are the medications that are, if you look at the label, you will see sheep or goats. So the ones that I have bolded are ones that um, are the, kind of the ones that I'm most used to working with. The ones that are not bolded are either feed additives or water additives that are used for only very specific purposes. So for sheep, if I'm looking for an antibiotic that is labeled for sheep for some disease, primarily respiratory disease, my choices are mycotil, Naxel and penicillin. Those are the three drugs that have sheep on the label. For goats, just Naxel, that's it. When we look at dewormers, I know this is not a dewormer talk, but dewormer wise, we're also limited. For sheep, we have Cydectin, Ivamec, Prohibit, and Valbazin. And for goats, we have Safeguard and Valbazin. Does that mean we can't use other medications? The answer is it depends. But when we look on a label, this is the information that is available to you on the actual bottle. So most of our medications are gonna come in a cardboard box. They're gonna have a product insert that has all the same information that's on the bottle, but a lot of the uh, safety and efficacy data included in there as well. So if you want the absolute best picture for what that medication is all about, you should read the product insert. But at the very least, before you're using any medication, you should look at the bottle and look for these things. So we're going to look at the name, and that includes a trade name, which is the uh, name that the manufacturing company has given it. So Naxel, for example, as well as the generic drug name, which in Naxel's case is Septiofur. So that is the actual active ingredient. You're also going to see on there the concentration of medication, which is usually expressed as milligrams per milliliter because all of those antibiotics are available in a liquid form. Um, and for some medications, for example, like ox oxytetracycline, we have a 200 milligrams per milliliter version and we have a 300 milligram per milliliter version. So those are going to have different dose uses. Indications. That means what is this medication actually labeled for? So what diseases would this medication be appropriate to use? The dose, which is how much to actually give, usually based on weight. Any warning statements? So for example, um, do not use this medication in lactating females or uh, any human health warnings, for example. Withdrawal times for meat and milk. And those withdrawal times, we're gonna have a whole discussion on it in a moment, but that's the period of time between medication administration and harvest of that animal product that basically the drug has been cleared from that animal system. 
any storage requirements, which are very important to follow, including keep refrigerated, protect from light, and then an expiration date and a lot and or serial number, which is also very important because that date is basically the last day that the manufacturer guarantees its efficacy as long as you followed the storage um, requirements. So I've pulled just one label and I chose this one specifically because it does have a very serious human health issue attached to it. So um, I've highlighted things because I know the label is a little bit hard to read, but in yellow here, I have my trade name, Mycotil 300, and I have my actual drug name, the generic name, Tomacosin below it. Directly below that in purple, I have my concentration. So this is 300 milligrams per milliliter. And then it gives you some of the carriers down here as well. Directly below that, I have what species it's usable for. So for subcutaneous use in cattle and sheep only. So if goats are not on this label, I should probably not use it in goats based on what this label is telling me. At the bottom here in orange, it gives me the indication. So for treatment of bovine respiratory disease, um, and ovine respiratory disease associated with manha manheimia, control of respiratory disease in cattle, okay? Uh, at the top here, sorry, I have to move my little person thing. In red, uh, warning, Mycotil must be used with quick fit connector, contact Elanco for this equipment and read safe handling practices. Okay, we'll get to that. In blue, administration instruction, so subcutaneous and cattle and sheep only, only for use in sheep greater than 15 kilograms, subcutaneous dose of one mil per 30 kgs. Uh, warning number two, do not inject more than 10 mils per site. Okay, warning number three, um, do not use an automatically powered syringes, do not administer intravenously, intravenous injection in cattle will be fatal, do not use in lambs less than 15 kgs, do not administer to animals other than cattle or sheep, death following exposure to Tilmacotian injection has been reported in goats, rabbits, pheasants, pigs, dogs, deer, cats, alpacas, and horses. Uh, the next thing is our actual residue, so our withdrawal times. Um, it's pretty much always in these little arrows, so here, 42 days. Animals intended for human consumption must not be slaughtered within 42 days. It also has a label, do not use in lactating dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Notes, storage conditions. On the next page, we have a fourth warning. And in this case, it says human warning, not for human use. Injection of this drug in humans has been associated with fatalities. Okay, that's pretty important to know. And then in this green box here, our serial number and expiration date would be printed on there uh, during bottling. So if I hand you this bottle of medication and you've never used Mycotil before and you load it up in your powered syringe and you accidentally stab yourself with it, it would be very important for you to know that this medication can cause human fatalities and you need to seek physicians like immediately. Um, so my big thing, I'm an educator, I work in a college now, my biggest thing is I have all of my students, whatever we're using that day, you need to read the entire label. And before you actually handle this medication, whether you're wearing gloves or we're touching sheep or whatever, you need to know what you're handling, not only for the safety of the animal, making sure that we're giving it in an appropriate way, at an appropriate dose, but also for your own safety. So that brings us kind of to the withdrawal period discussion. Withdrawal periods, as I've mentioned multiple times so far, um, are the period of time after administration of the medication that the products from that animal are not safe for human consumption. So that takes into account how each species uh, metabolizes that drug within their body and how long it takes for it to be clear from their muscle, which will be meat, and their milk. Withdrawal periods are set during that initial um, FDA CVM review. So that is part of the data that they're collecting from the manufacturing company. So they're looking at different body tissues and how quickly do those tissues no longer have any medication there. So when you look at a label and the withdrawal is let's say 28 days, that withdrawal only is true if you have followed the other uh, administration instructions. So if it says on there, give intravenously, and you decide it's really hard for me to hit a vein, I'm just going to give it IM, you can no longer use the withdrawal that is printed on that label. 
It is also important to note that having a labeled withdrawal period does not mean that there is absolutely no drug left in the animal's body. There are a lot of individual factors that will change how an animal can process a drug. And there's actually um, what we call tolerance level. So there are very tiny amounts of drug that are allowed to be left within meter milk. And usually those tolerances are in a parts per million or parts per billion level. So it's teeny tiny. Um, and those have been uh, considered safe for human consumption at that time. So that is only for medications that um, have, that are labeled for that species. I've included my little picture here of penicillin as well, because we're not only concerned about, um, you know, withdrawal times as far as administration route goes, but we're also concerned about potential other safety things. So penicillin, for example, uh, it's supposed to be given intramuscularly, so into the muscle. Um, but if you accidentally do get a little bit into a vein, it can actually stop the heart and cause death. So read the label and follow the label unless uh, you have been instructed by your veterinarian otherwise. Because we have so few medications available for sheep and goats, we really rely on what we as veterinarians call extra label drug use, which is abbreviated ELDU. This is only legally allowed under veterinary direction. So as a producer, you cannot look at that label and be like, well, it says one cc per 100 pounds, but Dr. Vandeplast told me that that's not effective, so I'm just going to go with four. You cannot make that decision, but your veterinarian can. In addition, it requires prolonged withdrawal periods. And there are a bunch of rules still surrounding what medications we can and cannot use extra labelly and in what ways we are using it extra labelly. So some medications we can actually use at a different dose than the labeled dose. Penicillin would be a great example of that. Some medications we'll be using for diseases that are not actually on the label. So if it says just respiratory disease on the label, maybe we're using it for foot rot instead because it's very effective against foot rot and we don't have another option to treat foot rot. Or it may be using medications for species other than those on the label, which is our biggest use for our sheep and goats because again, we only got three antibiotics for sheep and one for goats. So it's not just I as a veterinarian can decide, you know what, I'm gonna use this. I have to follow a whole bunch of rules. I have to be knowledgeable about the drugs that I am recommending to you. And I still need to follow good antimicrobial stewardship practices. So again, lots of rules surrounding this use. And again, extra label drug use is only allowed under veterinary direction. You as a producer deciding to use a different dosage is illegal. So there are still limitations. Just because a medication might work well doesn't mean it's actually legal to do so. So one of my big pushes then, um, and I've been working on this with my own farms and my own school where I work now, I've spent hours and hours and hours creating treatment protocols. So if I have a sheep that has pneumonia and I give a description of pneumonia, these are the actual steps that we're gonna use for treatment. So that if I am not here on campus, I can direct my students to our treatment protocol and they will be able to treat that sheep appropriately. So treatment protocols work hand in hand with approved medication lists. And these approved medication lists are lists of medications your veterinarian has approved for use on your farm, which may include extra label use. So for me, it's usually just a front and back thing, and it has all the information that you'd need for all the medications on your farm. So I have indications, reason to use, which species you can use them in. I have the dosage, I have the route, I have the withdrawal periods, and then I have other use notes all on these pages that I have laminated and then put in our barns. So the point of these approved medication lists in conjunction with written treatment protocols is number one, to prevent meat and milk residues. Because if you are selling your animals, you're marketing either meat or milk, or you're selling this project animals or whatever, your number one goal is to provide a quality product that is safe, okay? In addition though, there are some economic benefits. So it prevents you from purchasing medications that you'll never use. If I don't have a treatment protocol that includes the use of new floor, there's no reason for you to have a bottle of new floor. New floor is pretty expensive. Um, it prevents you from using medications incorrectly, either through incorrect administration techniques. So for example, IM versus IV, or for diseases they don't work against. 
It also allows me as a veterinarian to prescribe medications extra labelly. So again, kind of working outside the label. That's again, especially important for our sheep and goats who we don't have that many options for. And I will remind you once again, that extra label drug use is only allowed under veterinary direction. The biggest issue with extra label drug use is the prolonged withdrawal period. So um, Draxin is an antibiotic that I use pretty commonly in sheep and on the label for cattle it says 18 days. It is not an 18 day withdrawal for sheep. And the follow up to that is the tolerance level for extra label drug use is absolute zero. So most of our other medications, we have those low tolerance levels at parts per million, parts per billion. If an animal comes up with any sort of residue, whether it's a parts per trillion, I don't know, of Draxin, and it's a sheep, which is not on the Draxin label, that's an illegal residue. In addition, approved medications will allow you and your vet to track drug usage and identify disease trends, which is a really important management tool, and allow your veterinarian to easily refill medication prescriptions. So I have a school farm. Um, I literally send my approved medication sheet with my signature on it to their drug supplier, and they're able to get whatever medications they need. All my indications are there. All of my withdrawal periods are already there. So it's much less work for me. So the bottom line here, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. So this is an example of one of my approved medications. Uh, this is for my current school farm here. Um, I have them categorized by drug class. So this is just a snippet from my kind of support medications. I have the drug. If that drug has um, a generic name, I'll put the generic name as well. The use, the dose, the route, the withdrawal, and then any notes. So this is all the information that would also be available on the medication bottle. But in this case, if I'm using things extra labely, this is what I'm going to follow. That being said, there are some prohibited medications that are not ever, ever, ever allowed in food animals. And that includes pets who are a food animal species. So if you have a pet goat, we are still not allowed to use these medications because there is always the very small chance that your pet goat ends up in the food chain at some point. So these medications include chloramphenicol, clenbuterol, diethylstilbestrol, fluoroquinolone class antibiotics like ciprofloxacin, glycopeptides like vancomycin, nitromidazoles like metronidazole. That's actually one that I have seen scripted out to um, a small goat farm because of uh, inconsistencies with uh, who the veterinarian was. Nitrofurans, including frazolidine and nitrofurazone, which are very common uh, like horse wound ointments. Those are not legal for use in some, uh, food animals. So we're reaching the end of the time here. I have a couple, well, it's, it's a fairly extensive list of common issues I see with medication use. And this is not just small ruminants. I have kind of tailored this list to small ruminants, but I see a lot of these same issues in um, show and project animals too. Sharing medications with other farms or producers, bad idea. Um, if you have not handled that medication correctly, or if they are trying to give you a medication and it hasn't been handled correctly, uh, might be contaminated, might have issues. Uh, Batril is absolutely illegal for use in sheep and goats because there's a um, ciprofloxacin is a very important human antibiotic. Axonel and Exceed, also technically illegal um, because Naxel is on label. And the, pe the reason people would prefer Axonel or Exceed is because you don't have to give it every day. But convenience is actually not a valid reason for extra label drug use. Toltrazoril and panazoril dewormer. Um, Toltrazoril is actually not labeled in the US, but panazoril is marquee, which is a human dewormer. Use in sheep and goats is illegal. Horses are not food animals. So we do not have safety data on giving that medication to sheep and goats. Same thing for the nitrofurazone ointment. Um, banamine, which is an excellent anti-inflammatory, it is labeled for intravenous use only, but it can be very difficult to hit a vein, especially on those real big meaty like boar goats. Um, again, convenience is not a reason for extra label drug use. In addition, banamine particularly is very tissue reactive. So it's supposed to go in the vein because it causes really big um, tissue changes, muscle changes um, on slaughter. DMSO, you can sometimes find it in the horse section. It, we, we just 
don't know. We don't have any safety met like data on using that in food animals. Same thing with motor oil or fluid film for ringworm. Um, there are other like actually safe, effective ways to treat ringworm besides using those. Um, and then kind of getting to antibiotics and a little bit touching back with what Carmen was saying, giving all sick animals some sort of antibiotic. Not all sick animals need an antibiotic. It depends on what disease they have. Um, in addition, giving multiple medications before calling a veterinarian. If you are calling me because you've had this doe with pneumonia for the last week and you've given her six different drugs, I don't know what we're actually dealing with. There's too much going on there. Um, giving every sick animal oxytetracycline and dexamethasone, it's just, you're wasting money. And again, it makes it really hard for me as a veterinarian to figure out what's going on not following quality assurance guidelines. So um, where should I give injections? How do I give a sub-Q injection? How uh, much, what volume of medication can I give per site? Uh, using certain medications in different species. So copper tox, for example, using that in sheep can be deadly. Sheep are exceptionally uh, sensitive to copper. Uh, using mycotil, for example, in goats has been fatal. Um, again, not a deworming lecture, but deworming project or pet animals on a regular basis contributes to parasite resistance. Uh, mixing medications can be um, deadly. So mixing NSAIDs like banamine with steroids like dexamethasone can affect the abomasal lining and actually cause abomasal ulcers, which can lead to death. And just personal um, pet peeve blue coat on anything. I would throw all blue coat in the trash because it be makes it very difficult to monitor how the wound is healing. It doesn't wash off and now everything is like purple. So use alu spray, which looks way cooler. It's silver um, and is actually, it allows me to see how the wound is healing. So who cares? Well, I think, I hope I've made it clear. Different formulations of the same medication clear the body at different rates. Using medications meant for not food animals, we don't have safety data for, we don't know how it affects uh, the animal's products. We are limited with the number of antibiotics we have that are available and effective, and we want to preserve those. And the same is true for our dewormers or our anthelminthics as well. Uh, we don't have that many, and we want them to be effective forever because sheep and goats are very prone to parasitic so I hope you learned something today. I'm glad you're here. We're talking about this because this is uh, one of the biggest areas that I have seen a lot of just issues with. Um, my recommendations would be don't just go online and do whatever they're uh, saying there. Um, don't just go to someone who says, well, we've done it this way forever, because we have new techniques and new drugs and new things all the time that may be more effective. And don't go to the feed store and believe the college kid that has never raised goats what you need to do. You need to have a relationship with your veterinarian, and you also need to have relationships with other reputable producers in your area and join a breed or a species association. ASI has done a wonderful job of um, publicizing this GFI 263 thing. They have a lot of uh, information on their website. ADGA has done some of the same stuff. So finding people who have done this and who are open to trying new things and are listening and knowledgeable is really, really important. And for some of you, that might not be a veterinarian, okay? Because small room in a veterinarian, it's trial and error. How did I get into doing sheep and goats? Because no one else would. And they sent me to a lambing one day and I was like, okay, I guess this is what I'm doing now. So if you're willing to work with a veterinarian who has little small ruminant experience, you can contribute very positively to your community. Just realize there's gonna be learning mistakes along the way. But stay in touch with other producers, stay in touch with your breed um, or producer associations. Um, kind of last little bit here, this does not mean, GFI 263 does not mean you need to hold on to your medications forever. That was one of the most common things I saw in 2018. Like, oh no, I can't get my drugs anymore, so I'm just gonna hold on to this. It expired in 2013, but I'll keep it forever. No, okay? Um, you're messing with the efficacy of that drug. Throw it away at the expiration date or dispose of it appropriately. If you have medication bottles that look like this, this is a real picture from one of the vets on one of her dairy farms. That it probably needs to go away. And if you have medications or vaccines stored in your fridge, you probably need to get a thermometer to make sure that your fridge is actually maintaining them at an appropriate um, temperature. 
Okay, at the end here, the last thing, you use your medications appropriately. What else do you need to do? Just keep a record of it. So your record should include um, or are used to avoid medication residues. You're just providing literally a record of what you gave to who and when. Keep track of which animals have needed extra attention. So that's a management thing. Keep track of which medications you're using most frequently. If suddenly you're going through six bottles of penicillin in a month, what's going on? Like, what's the deal? Um, keep track of which diseases you're seeing most frequently, act as along for farm audits. So if you do come up with a residue, you can prove like, hey, I gave whatever according to all these directions and I still got a residue, like what, what happened? And then finally identify patterns and disease processes and animal groups. So for example, if you're always seeing pneumonia in one part of your barn, maybe it's that part of your barn, even as animals cycle in and out. So these are the things you need to write down, the date of treatment, animal ID, what medication you used, how much you used, how you gave it, where you gave it. So for injections, I like right neck, left neck, right shoulder, left shoulder, um, and withdrawal information according to whatever is on your medication sheet. Because remember, if you're using extra label medications, that withdrawal is going to be prolonged compared to what's on the label. And then who gave it? Just initials. Um, and for me, because I have employees that are giving a lot of my medications, it's just a way for me to check in and be like, hey, why did you give so-and-so 30 cc's when it should have been 10? Um, so we can do a little bit of follow-up education. So this is an example of my treatment record that just includes all of that information. Um, and then we do have a software management system that I input all of this into, but if you're not you don't want to make that investment, you can absolutely manage based on paper records. So here are some of the resources um, that I use to kind of put together this presentation and some further reading. A lot of these are based on cattle um, because again, small ruminants are specialty, um, but a lot of what they say is very valid. And then some medication resources as well. So that's all I have. Um, I don't want to open it to comments or. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have a number of questions rolling in. Some of them you kind of hit on. Um, but I think some of them, and we can kind of go between um, any of us. I think most of them are geared towards that veterinarian um answer so if you hold with us for a little bit dr vanderplatz yeah um so the first question kind of being as far as grandfathering in i guess you would say old medication you know carmen had talked about don't load up right before this goes into effect um but those those medicines that we already have um, this law will not be subject to those, or how is that going to work? Um, you can hold on to them until their expiration date. That's safe to do. You just won't be able to buy new bottles of those. Okay, so everyone, everyone will be safe to use whatever they have as long as um, that's not, they, they just can't purchase any more then. Okay. Um, the next one you alluded to, and I, this is something we struggle with here in Utah as well, is there, there is a growing um, amount of revenue being associated with small ruminants in vet clinics, but very few veterinarians are up to the task really to handle some of these challenges of small ruminants. And so I, th I think as that demand comes more with the money, I think we'll see more veterinarians trained. But what do we do when we don't have a veterinarian, especially in some of maybe kind of rural areas where we just can't find anyone? Um, it's gonna come down to probably those traveling vets. So um, it's becoming more and more popular for vets to be acting as solo practitioners and just visiting little areas day by day. So tomorrow I'm going to be wherever, three days from then I'm going to be wherever. So please call me for your herd health needs and stuff. Um, the other option would be looking into telemedicine within your state. Again, state regulations vary a lot. 
Um, so here in California, I'm like not allowed to do any sort of telemedicine um, unless I've met with you and I'm looking at a specific patient. But some states will allow after that initial visit, if you have a question, we can get on Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or whatever. Um, and that can act as a uh, record as well or an animal visit. That does assume that you have supplies on hand usually or that you have the ability to get those supplies from elsewhere. Um, I think probably for those places, finding one of the traveling vets and then working with um, an outside pharmacy or a pharmacy that can ship to you is probably your best option. But it, it's absolutely the biggest challenge with sheep and goats. Um, like I said, I got into this because no one else at the practice I was at wanted to see them. Um, and so I well, just- Well, kind of thank became, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. So I just kind of became the default person, but it, it really, if you are one of those producers, you know, you've been doing this for 20 years and you haven't been able to have a veterinarian available to you, be the person to help train someone. If you have a small animal vet in your area that is willing to work with you and learn from you, because I will be the first person to admit, I learned so much from my producers that I worked with. Um, be that person so that you can provide for other small ruminant producers in your area. Yeah, and I, I want to add to that a little bit because we've had some of that coming up in, in our area. And um, the way we kind of started with those traveling vets is actually going to like a feed store co-op or a livestock supply company. And it might not be in your rural community, but like we have one in Idaho Falls and they have a vet that is like a contractor of theirs. And so you get put on the list and they will go to your operation. And then once you've made that initial contact, the vet will set up, like you've, like you've said, like those treatment protocols that are with that uh, livestock supply company. And then in our area, they have like drop locations where like, if you need a bottle of penicillin, they will get it out to Mackie in like 24 hours, which like some of our treatments have to happen faster than that, but they'll also have that list so you can have it on hand as well. So the one thing I will say about that, I totally agree, Carmen, food stores has been like one of the big places. Um, the only thing you need to think about too is emergency coverage. So if you do have really bad lambing or kidding or whatever, and you're using a vet who lives, you know, two states away from you, um, looking around at local vet schools, they will often take emergencies. You just have to transport your animal there. Um, but if that is your only option, that's kind of what you got. That is something that when you establish the VCPR, you should have a plan for, or your vet will have a plan for. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that goes into one of these other questions is the worry behind not having tools on hand and the timeliness in which we can get those tools to help animals, you know. And I think in the past with especially a lot of our larger producers, Sometimes the cost of the animal doesn't outweigh the vet bill, right? Absolutely. So I, I hope this doesn't add a, another further barrier to some of us, um, but I think if we have action and plan, it can help out. So I think, I think probably the best thing you can do if you are concerned about supplies, like establish your VCPR, find a veterinarian, and then seriously work on those treatment protocols and an appropriate or a, um, allowed medications list. Because that will cut down kind of, okay, I have, you know, three antibiotics, I have two anti-inflammatories and a couple nutritional supplements. That should be able to handle, I don't know, 95% of your emergencies. Um, and because you're only buying, you know, a bottle here or there, because you have a very limited list to work off of, you're not going to be throwing away bottles that you never touched. That's the economics behind that allowable medications list is not because I want to control everything you do. I'm trying to just like, you don't need new floor and Draxin and Micotil and penicillin and, 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 you know, we have some fairly broad spectrum ones. We just need to use them in an appropriate way. Yeah. And so one of the last questions that popped up, but because we're talking about is, so what are some of the most, I guess, most important, but most common? I mean, the important ones are always the ones we need at the time, but what are maybe the best bang for our buck as far as having that medicine around for use on our small ruminant farm? Um, so again, you should talk to your veterinarian because every right. farm is going to be different. But overall, uh, my most commonly used ones for small ruminants are going to be Draxin, Penicillin, um, Meloxicam. Those are like my three 
drugs, and then sometimes new floor. I don't use oxytetracycline. It's basically water. It doesn't work on anything that I want it to work on. Um, so those are kind of well, my drugs. And Draxin was the one you said is not labeled. Correct. Yeah. Um, new floor is not labeled. Draxin is right. not labeled and Meloxicam is not labeled. Right. So you'd need a prescription for all of those anyway. Right. And, uh, the, the cost of Draxin would probably push a lot of people away anyway. It's a, you can, it's a so, very yeah. expensive. Yes, they do sell, sell 50 mil yeah. bottles, though, that I think are $150. And yeah. you're using such a small volume per treatment that you can have a bottle of Draxin last a long time. Mm -hmm. And it is excellent for basically all respiratory disease. Yeah. But talk to your veterinarian. So, um, great. So I'm trying to look through some of these questions, and maybe some of you have looked through some of these also. Um, can you just reiterate the the blue coat and the fact what was the other product and I've used both products the new the one you're talking about I've also used blue coat in the past especially with the kind of those range animals that they'll go out and be away for months and so you get something on there you never really look at it again you know it is really the reality to some of it you know yeah so the other product is alu spray it is silver it looks really cool, but if like, especially if you're keeping an animal penned up, they got attacked by a dog or whatever, and we want to put just a protective layer on this wound, putting blue coat on, I will never be able to look at the wound again. I will be able to with alu spray because it will wash off if I want it to, but it works in, it's a different compound, but it works in pretty much the same way. It's just a layer of protection. Mm -hmm. Alu spray. Alu yeah. spray, yeah. Um, have you been looking through any of these, Karma, Carmen? Yeah, the um, one question they had, what nutritional supplements do you recommend having on hand? Um, thiamine, especially if you have project animals, because polio is real and it happens a lot. Um, I like having Nutri-Drench too. It's just, it has a little bit of everything in there. It's nice to give to anyone who's a little bit off um, and then some sort of probiotic. So like probios is a commercial one that's great, but if you can't get it, cause it can be kind of expensive, um, mm -hmm. literally just yogurt that says live and active cultures on it or kefir, which is a yeast yogurt. Mm -hmm. um, those work really well too. Good. Yeah, and I, I have noticed the price of probios, especially in stores has gone up a lot. But if you can justify buying it in bulk online, it's like a third of the price. <laughs> so just a little plug. They do sell, it's like powder versus the tube and the powder is definitely the better bang for your buck, but you do have to make okay. it. Okay, good to know. Oh, okay, well, so, oh did Go you ahead. have one, Chad? Go ahead. Um, one of the questions, and I think this would be good to, for you to cover, is your treatment protocols act as a standing order. So do you need to call that when you see something happening, or do you just notice the illness and then treat? It depends on how your veterinarian writes them. So I write mine that at the top, there's a description of the disease. And then based on the severity of that disease, there are slightly different treatment protocols. So if I have a pneumonia case and it is described within my treatment protocol, okay, this sounds like a mild case. I don't need to call my vet. I'm going to treat according to their directions within that protocol. And then usually at the last little bit, there should be a note about record keeping. So record all medications given. And then there should be a note about if it doesn't get better in X period of time, you should call your veterinarian. So they're meant to be written for your specific operation for things that you have been trained to notice. I can't just hand you this binder of treatment protocols and be like, okay, well, I'll never talk to you again, because you need to actually have an idea of what those say and what does pneumonia look like? What does diarrhea look like? What does coccidiosis look like? What does bloat look like? We need to have a conversation during one of those veterinary visits about what those things look like. So there is some training behind that. Um, and you are, I'm going to tell you up front, you're going to be paying for your veterinarian's expertise and time in writing those things because 
for my little three units here, I probably spent 80 hours putting all those protocols together. It's specific for our operation. There's a lot of information in there. I can go away for a week and my students will be able to figure it out. So it's not to replace you ever contacting your veterinarian, but for kind of routine things like pneumonia or diarrhea, it's meant to give you some uh, independence in treating. Good. So I, I, there's one more question, Chad, that I <clears throat> wanted to ask because I'm interested as well. Uh, so the question is, so if we have a bottle of medicine for a disease, can we use it on all the animals in our flock that may contract that disease, even if they didn't have it at the time we got the medicine? And I have a little like add into this. Um, so like if you're going to give a product like Multimin or Bosi, I feel like that's kind of where this might be leading those type of products. So okay. so I don't use Multimin at all because it scares me. And I had a herd of goats. They were being used as brush goats when I like first started practicing. And some other person had recommended, oh, just give them a Multimin because they all look bad. And uh, three quarters of those goats died. So I don't use Multimin at all. I do use both the that would be something built into your like annual processing protocols that you should also be working with your veterinarian with. So for example, we're gonna be processing all of our ewes next week in one of my classes. All the ewes are gonna get BOCI, everyone's gonna get their CDNT booster for the year. Um, and we're gonna be deworming those that need deworming. So if you are talking about some sort of preventative product like BOCI, that should be written into your uh, like annual processing stuff. If you're talking about a disease, uh, it will depend on that particular situation. So if I just brought in, I just bought, I don't know, 400 brush does from the auction yard and about half of them have pink eye and a third of those also have pneumonia, I may end up treating literally everyone in that group because I can pretty much guess that the rest of those are going to end up with kind of the same signs, but that's going to depend on a whole bunch of different factors. So in cases like that, where you're talking about mass treatment and it's not just like a preventative thing, you should talk to your veterinarian. Okay. Um, so one of the other questions is, if there's been any, anything you know about non-ionic surfactants, um, so they mentioned one of basic H that's been promoted by some people added to drinking water periodically for worm prevention. I know that you had had some stuff up there with, you know, hinting at deworming, but have you heard anything associated with that? I have never heard of this product. Um, and I have just done a whole bunch of parasite stuff. So I, I can't really speak on it, but I will say I haven't heard of it and I don't know anyone that is using it. Your best bet for worm prevention is gonna be pasture management, um, doing in, uh, regular evaluations of your animals, FAMACHA scoring, fecal egg counts and deworming those that need deworming. Yeah, I would, I know Kelly, you've done some of your PhD work was in um, parasites. Do you have any comments on this? I have also not heard of it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean that, um, I'm trying to remember the website. There's a great website, you know, just following up um, Vander Plot's um, comment, you know, just pasture management, that sort of thing, you know, talking to your veterinarian, how often you're deworming and stuff. Um, what is it, the small ruminant um, parasite? Consortium. Yes, <laughs> that one. Yeah, so if you're it, looking it for- yeah for good information on just like pastor stuff like that's a good place to go yeah and and the individual that they're talking about who is promoting this is is from the south and i know going to different conferences that if you're in the south there's always you know a lot of talk between producers trying to figure out new ways to help com combat that parasite issue um, but you know as far as this whole talk about off-label use and things like that. Make sure to have that relationship with your veterinarian if you're going to be treating stuff that is off-label. Um, I'll have to look into this, um, these surfactants also. I haven't heard of this in any of my parasite research I've done either. So um, a new one for all of us. We all learn something, right? <laughs>